Um, <coughs> seeing that we are now, we're now beginning the, the book of Shmois, the second book of the Chumash this week, and we meet here the persona, personality of Moshe Rabbeinu Moses. Let's see if we can try to have a little insight into the nature of the central position that he occupies in Torah. It's called Torah's Moshe. It's really called his Torah. There's a very deep sense in which he is central to the whole, the whole process and the whole notion of what Torah is. And perhaps the best way to, to approach that is to start with a question that is raised by the... Uh, this question is raised by the son of the Rambam, who has a commentary... He has a commentary which, of which we have the first two books of Chumash. He has a commentary on the... I don't know whether there, there, there was more at one time, we just don't have it, or whether he only wrote on, on these two. But in his, in his commentary, he raises a interesting question that is a question on the very process, what we call chat, the, the words themselves, the order of the words. And from this, he brings out a fascinating <coughs> principle. In fact, he says that this, um, the resolution of this problem that he raises is one of the most beautiful he himself says that it's a uniquely beautiful insight, very unusual to hear, one of the Rishonim say that they, their words are usually very very short they're usually very unusual to hear them speak about the, the value or the beauty of the of the idea itself but he says that, he says in fact he heard this from his father, the Rambam, who heard it from the period of the Goenim, which predates him by a number of, couple of centuries and let, let's see the question that he sets up and see if we can find our way through um, find our way through the resolution of this and come out hopefully with a new principle which will give us an insight into this person, this uh, unique individual, unique in the history of the world that we, whom we call our teacher Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses, our, our teacher the question is like this when you follow the when you follow the, um, the sequence, in this week's Pasha it says this, famous interchange between, the famous interchange between Moshe, Hashem and Moshe, God and Moses, in which he tells him to go down to Egypt and carry his message to the Jewish people, to Pharaoh, and the conversation goes like this. Hashem says to him, go down and take my message you, you are the redeemer you will bring the message of redemption you'll be the, you'll be the girl you'll be the one who will take them out and when Hashem gives him his instruction to go and say what he has to say Moshe answers like this Moses said to Hashem be Hashem I'm not a man of words all these words need explanation but I'm just going to try and pick out one theme here which we need to focus on from the time, not, the, not yesterday, not the day before, and not, in fact, not since you began speaking to me, have I been able to say over what I have to say. I am heavy of mouth and of tongue. I am not able to, not able to speak. He had a, Moshe Ben, it's known, had a speech, very hard for us to say, a defect or a deficiency, but he could not speak normally. There are many insights into this which in, which in their own right need to be examined. I mean, you probably know that one of the most famous insights that's been offered from various quarters is the fact that one of the reasons that... I mean, it is strange to choose as a spokesman a person who can't speak. Right? It is very unusual. I mean, that's noteworthy in itself. Why does Hashem choose as a spokesperson for the Jewish people? If you had to elect someone right, if to represent... If we were sitting in this room, we needed a representative, a spokesperson. Would you choose the one among us who has a speech defect? I mean, there have to be something wrong with you, too, to think on those lines. Why did Hashem choose His agent to go down and bring the ultimate message to the world? Not just the message of redemption of the Jewish people, but Torah. Hashem speaks, the Holy, the Spirit of Hashem, as it were, speaks through the throat of Moshe. He is the, he is the, he is the channel. Why do you choose a channel when you want to play a musical instrument? You choose one not that's cracked, that is defective. You choose one that, that will carry the sound. One of the most famous insights into this is that, on the contrary, when you want the message to be pure, then you don't want the vessel to add anything of its own. If you have a glib speaker, yes, if you want an important message to put a, be put across, then a slick and glib and very articulate speaker may be problematic, because you cannot be sure that the message 
is pure, when the vessel adds something, then there's no assurance that the content, you want a vessel to be broken, the vessel must be so beaten <coughs> that there's no question that all the value is in the contents. Or put it another way in more, more simplistic terms, is that if, if Moses would have been a great orator, then there would have always been throughout history the suspicion that he was, it was his personality and his gift that had swayed people and in fact swayed history. And therefore, paradoxically, unlike the, the secular notion, our Torah is transmitted through a person who, <laughs> who, whose mode of transmission is broken, so that what comes out is only the Torah itself, right? When you want pure wine, you put it in the simplest of vessels. If you put wine in an expensive vessel, you put wine in gold and silver, then the metal spoils the contents. <coughs> furthermore, furthermore, on a much higher plane, the Maharal says, famous insight that he writes in the Deferis Israel, he says that this deficiency of Moshe really was his perfection. It's another way of saying the same thing, but on a deeper plane. This defect of his so-called defect really was his perfection. Even though the Medrash indicates that he, this defect began when he put hot coals to his tongue, when he, he was a child sitting on Paro's lap, on Pharaoh's lap. He was being brought up by one of the great ironies of history in Jewish history is that it's always like this, and it's another theme in its own right, is that the agent of destruction, the agent of Pharaoh's own downfall, was being raised by him. There's a, there's a, there's a certain delicious irony in that, is that, is that Paro, Pharaoh, who's planning the destruction of the Jewish people, and his mystical advisors are telling him to drown every newborn Jewish male, right? because certainly from one of them, one of them will be the Redeemer. And as he's giving the orders to do that, and the orders for destruction of ch- Jewish children are going out, he on his knee is raising the very child, right? who will be his own nemesis. And when, and when the crown was, when, when his advisors warned him of the danger, and a crown was brought, and the burning coals were brought, right? the assumption being that a child would go for that which glitters more, the coal which is glistening with fire. But if he had designs, that means if he's higher, in his higher representation, Moshe, the child, would have designs on being a king, then he would go for the crown. That would be the sign. And of course his head went out to the crown. And it was deflected mysteriously, miraculously, angelic intervention. And his hand touched the coal. And he put his hot, put the heat to his mouth. And that's where the, that's where the matter sits. That's where the speech defect. But be that as it may, that also needs thought. But be that as it may, the Maral says that his defect, in fact, was his perfection. Meaning that, and again this needs full analysis in its own right, but a, um, the ability to speak is a limiting of the material. When you can speak clearly, then you bring a thing from the spiritual world. When you, then the notion, the, na- the nature of speech, what speech means, is bringing down an abstraction of thought in which something is grasped as it actually is. Bringing it down into a world of words which are always the finite, inadequate packaging of that idea. And I think we've discussed this before on more than one occasion. And therefore, when you bring a thing down, let me switch off the one that's buzzing. When you bring a thing down into words, you then, by definition, you no longer have the thing itself. You don't know a thing the way you say it. The way you say a thing is only the inadequate words that you choose to put the thing across, but it's not the way you know the thing itself. You always know something. I mean, is this, how would you express yourself, for example? You know yourself as you are, beyond words. You can't possibly put that into a <coughs> string of words. It's always inadequate. The more meaningful the thing is, and the bigger it is in the mind, the more hopeless it is to put it into words. The process of bringing a thing down into the words is by definition a squeezing of the infinite into the finite. And Moshe Rabbeinu Moses was that individual who lived in a higher world. He's so so entirely, as we'll try to show this evening, he's so entirely lived in another another world that he was the one for whom it was impossible to bring things down into the finite packaging of words. And therefore a symptom, if you like, a sign of his perfection was the fact that he could not bring the infinite down into the finite. That's why he couldn't speak. It was not an imperfection. After the Torah was given, which is nothing other than the miracle of the infinite being put into the finite, the Torah is a finite document, no question about it. In its written form, it's a finite document. You can count the words, you can count the letters. But it contains an endless wisdom. 
after that miracle had been had taken place in the world, then he spoke normally. When it gets to the fifth of the five books of Chumash, when Moses, Moshe Rabbeinu himself begins his own words, it says, These are the words that he spoke. But he was only able to do that after the miraculous creation or revelation in the world of a finite set of words that contain endless or infinite wisdom. After that miracle had taken place, then he was able to be part of that miracle, as it were, which is what Torah is. But in the natural state, or before the giving of the Torah, he was unable to speak because, he, because the things that he knew, the material, the, the, the content, in other words, could not be put into, into words no matter how many. And therefore that was a revelation of his perfection. But be that as it may, he was, simply put, he was unable to speak it out, for all these reasons. So he said to Hashem, he said, I am heavy of kvad pe kvad loshen, heavy of mouth, heavy of tongue, cannot speak. And Hashem says, it's also a symptom of his, uh, a sign of his humility. We know that Moshe Rabbeinu was the greatest human being who ever lived. He was the humblest who ever lived. And the two go hand in hand, obviously. <coughs> the same again is the idea here that the, the vessel, the humbler the vessel, the more, the more empty the vessel, the more genuine content it can hold. And there's no accidental relationship between the, the, um, his, his intense humility and his intense greatness. And as part of that humility, and as part of the recognition of the reality, he said, I cannot speak clearly. So Hashem said to him, Me some pel Adam, who puts a mouth in a human being in the first place? Or me yosum ilay mocheresh, who makes people... Who makes people uh, able to speak in the first place, dumb or articulate, or iver, or piker or, 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 or iver, or sighted or blind? Hello, I am Hashem. And therefore, go, Vanoichi Eye, Leich, Vanoichi Eye and Picho, I shall go and speak, I will be with your mouth. Listen carefully to the words. I shall be with your mouth, Vahoire Sicho Asher to Dabber, and I will, I will teach you, the simple interpretation is, I will teach you what to say. The deeper source to say it means, I will make you pregnant with my word. Hoire Sicho has two meanings in Hebrew. Herayon means, it doesn't only mean, the root there is in common, there's a common root here, teaching and pregnancy, which means that. In the one, in the one the simple sense, it means, I will teach you what to say. Go down, have no fear, I will inform your, your speech. But the deeper meaning is, you will be, as it were, pregnant, there will be a living being within you, which will be my word. One of the reasons that Moshe doubted his ability here, one of the reasons was, there's a principle that Torah wisdom carries its own articulate ve- ve- um, vehicle. It's an interesting principle in Torah. That somebody who has Torah knowledge, Torah knowledge has its carries its own vehicle of expression. That means it's an assumption that if you have the genuine Torah, you also know how to put it across. It, it is part of Torah knowledge. In, in some analogous way to the fact that parental love carries with it the knowledge of how to make that love manifest. A parent, a parent who really loves a child does not need a course in parenting. Or a teacher who really loves a student, in fact in, in Jewish in Jewish thinking, the, the first criterion of being a teacher is to have a love for the student. Not a love for teaching. A love for the student. If you have a love for the student, if the Rebbe loves his Talmud, then he will know, right, the, the many sources say it's like the mother's milk. It comes exactly as much as the child needs. Not too much when it must not be more, and it's not too little when, when it must not be less. Rav Wasserman once told us he was once approached by a young man <coughs> who had been studying in Yeshiva for a number of years. And uh, he came to ask Rav Wasserman's advice about becoming a teacher. He said that he had been learning for a number of years and now his father wanted him to have a profession. His father felt he should now go and train so he'd have a means of earning a living. And therefore he was thinking of taking a teaching course. <coughs> he wanted to go and take a teaching course. So he came to ask Ravasam's advice that he think it was necessary for him to go and t- take that teaching course to become a teacher. So Ravasam said to him that when you know genuine, when you know Torah and you have a love for your students, then you find a way to put it across. Because what you're concerned about is not how much you know, but what the student really needs. And if you focus entirely on the need of the student, then you will know how to put it across. The Gemara says that the, the beautiful analogy that, that's the classic, the classic statement of this is that more, the Talmud says, more than the calf wants to drink, the cow wants to give. More than the calf wants to suckle, 
the cow wants to give her milk. So Rav Asman was the used to explain very clearly that the wrong way to understand that is in the animal sense, that, that more than the calf is thirsty, the cow is heavy with milk. She needs to give her milk. It's not, it's not right. It's not that the cow wants to give her milk. It's that the cow wants the calf to drink. There's a very big difference. The person who wants to offload his wisdom, to demonstrate his wisdom, that's a completely opposite characteristic than the one who wants the student to learn. Completely different. Completely. The one may, the one may destroy or drown a student. And therefore, Ravasman said to this young man, if you love your students, then you will be given the gift of knowing how to speak to them. But if you are teaching not because you love your students, but because you need a profession, I think you better take that course. So one of the questions that Moshe Rabbeinu had was, if I am to be the ultimate teacher of Torah in the world, why can I not speak naturally? That was one of the places he was coming from in his question. If you have not given me the ability to speak and you give me this wisdom, but I cannot say it in the world, then, then, then how can you be sending me on this mission? So Hashem said to him, I will give you the words to say. So Moshe said, be, be Hashem. Shlachna biyad tishlach. A very interesting statement. I mean, very hard to translate. The way you probably translate it in English is, you know, send whomever you will send. You know, in, in a sort of, uh, you know, if you insist. Hashem got angry with Moshe. And he said to him, Your brother Aaron, I know, he will, he will speak. And he's coming to meet you, and he will be happy. One of the, this is one of the commentaries pointed out here. The one, one of the, yet another reason that Moshe didn't want to take on this task was he felt he might be slighting his older brother. And Hashem assured him that he will be happy for you. He's not, or well, not a trace of jealousy. And you shall speak to him. And you shall put the words in his mouth. And I will be with your mouth. And his mouth. And I will teach you. And what you shall do. And he will speak for you to the people. He will be a mouth for you. And you will be to him, all very hard to translate. The word Elohim normally means, it's a word, it's a name of Hashem, of course, a divine name. But here the commentary says it means you will be like an angelic force, you will be an emanation of my being, as it were, to him. That's what he said. In other words, to sum it up, the conversation he, to this point is Moshe, go and tell the message in Egypt that you have to tell. Moshe says to Hashem, but I cannot, I cannot speak, you have not given me the ability to speak for all these reasons that we discussed. And so Hashem says to him, don't worry, Aaron, your brother, will speak for you. Right? At that point, the conversation should end. However, we pick it up a little later, next week's parasha, and the Rabbi Avram Ben Arambam says this, if you, if you continue the discussion, you see that the next stage of the discussion goes like this. Moshe says to Hashem, I have uncircumcised lips. How will Pharaoh hear me? And Hashem says to him again, Look, I have made you again the same expression, Elohim a, an angel and an, an emanation to Pharaoh. And Aaron, your brother, will be your prophet. Again, he will speak out your words. And you shall speak your words, what I shall command you, and Aaron, your brother, will speak to Paroi, and he will send the Jewish people out. So if you follow this conversation, <coughs> if you follow the sequence of discussion here, and you put it all together, it runs like this. Hashem says, Moshe, go and tell your message in Egypt to, Far- to Paroi and, and the Jewish people. Moshe turns back and says, Hashem, I cannot speak normally. Hashem says, don't worry about that, Aaron will speak for you. Moshe turns back and says, but Hashem, I cannot speak normally. Yeah, there's some non sequitur here in the, in the conversation. And then Hashem says to him again, Aaron, your, your brother will speak for you, and the words here, he will be your prophet. What, 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 what's going on? What did he not hear the first time? Again, yeah, again, speak your message. I cannot speak properly. Fine, Aaron will speak for you. I cannot speak properly. What, he didn't hear? And then Hashem said, no, Aaron will speak for you with slightly different language. He will be your prophet. He'll speak for you. Moshe says, fine. What didn't he hear the first time that he heard the second time? What explains this seemingly unnecessary repetition, the seeming misunderstanding? And Let's see if we can understand this. It's a fascinating subject. The principle here, let's try to understand the principle first, and then we'll, and then we'll see if we can come back finally and answer, our, answer this, this question with the, the depth that, we, that we've gained.
You have to understand that the prophecy of Moshe Rabbeinu, this is the fundamental principle, it's absolutely fundamental to Torah understanding altogether, is that the prophecy of Moses, the prophecy of Moshe Rabbeinu, is completely unlike any other prophecy. First of all, you know that the distinction between, again, without getting into too much Kabbalistic thinking, just perhaps one idea to share, is that, you know, the five books of Chumash, five books of Bible, whatever you want to call it, the, the Chumash itself, is different than the rest of the 19 books of Tanakh, right, in, in kind. The five books of Chumash are written on a plane of prophetic message, which is delivered by Moshe, that is completely different in the Kabbalistic literature, the way it's put, is that and perhaps doesn't speak too much about these things, but there are different parts of the body that represent certain spiritual energies. And this part of the body, the, the, the middle, the center of the body, is, so to speak, the, in the higher world, is conveyed as being the center from which Torah <coughs> comes. And it's from below the, the diaphragm, what's called Netzach and Hoed, the kidneys, let's say, or in certain Kabbalistic descriptions, the legs, it's from that part of the supernal structure that Nach comes out. In other words, the division of the scripture, or the canon, if you like, into the, the 24 books that we, that constitute the, the Torah, in a, in a broader sense, the first five of Chumash, and the rest afterwards of Joshua, Judges, Kings, Shmuel, Samuel, etc., they come from two different sources. The five books of Chumash, who, which were spoken out by Moshe Rabbeinu, come from a higher... They come from a categorically different source. Those that come from the rest of the Torah comes from, is an emanation of something that is, the legs always mean, legs always mean that which is not the thing itself, but which carries the thing into the world. What legs are, what the legs are in Kabbalistic writing, the legs are called Lebar Migufe, which means outside the body. The legs are not considered to be part of the body. The body Kabbalistically ends at the Yusoit, right, which is the, the bris, let's say where the body ends. The legs are external to the body, Kabbalistic writings. What legs do is they take the essence, which is the body itself, and they transmit it through space. The formation of children is the same energy in the internal world. Children are the production of the ability to produce children. Is in the inner world the same as what the legs are in the outer world. Again, needs much more, much more discussion. This is not the time for it. The, the commonality there is that the legs carry the body through the world, children carry the person through space and time. That means that the legs are the ability of a person to be projected elsewhere. Children in the inner world are a person's ability to be projected even more deeply. It's not accidental that the Torah, the Gemara, the Talmud, refers to a child as a foot of his father. And bra kara da'avur, that's the expression in the Talmud. A son is a foot of his father. What on earth does that mean? But it really means the father walks on that child through time. A fetus, incidentally, is called Yerech Ima, which means the loin or the thigh of the mother. The fetus is, is, is a thigh of the mother. And the child, the, the, the child born is a foot of the father. That's what it means. The feet or the legs are those organs that transmit the thing itself further. Torah was all really that should have been necessary. Only Torah. Maybe the book of Yeshua as well, could be. He also had a certain, certain attachment to the same level as Moshe. The Moshe Chochmah goes into this in his introduction to the book of Shemua. It's very interesting. Explains this. But from then on, the rest would not have been necessary. But as a result of the, of the fall and of the sin that took place during the giving of the Torah, the golden calf, as it were, the rest is necessary. In other words, there's a projection of Torah into the world, which is carried by, which means that the other prophets have a completely different function. Moshe Rabbein and Moses' prophecy, as it were. Moshe Rabbein comes from the upper half of the body. And the other prophets come from the lower half of the supernal structure. Now, their function is different. They categorically differentiate. One of the places you see this most clearly is in the 13 principles. You know, and again, I think we've discussed some of these in their own right here previously. You know that we have 13 articles of faith, if you like. The Yud Gimel Ikrim. Some people have a habit of, uh, custom of saying these every day. The Rambam, in his uh, commentary to the Mishnah, he lists 13 
principles of so-called articles of faith, creed, creedal statements. And for, just for convenience sake, I'll, I'll, re- I'll read you the version that is printed in the, in the Sidurim. This is probably not the Rambam's own wording, but they're very succinct statements of summaries of, of, <coughs> of, his, of his discussion. And in these 13 articles, we have a, a delineation of the 13 things on which, the fundamental things on which Torah stands. <coughs> What's fascinating about them is that, in terms of our subject this evening, the sixth one says like this. I mean, we're familiar with these principles, right? Hashem's existence, His oneness, His incorporeality, the truth of, of, of the Torah message, prophecy, that means prophecy in general, all the way through to the Messianic, Advent, resurrection of the dead. When it comes to prophecy, it says this, I believe with a perfect faith, that all the words of the prophets are true. So when it comes to the principle of prophecy, there's an axiom here, that all prophetic, all the words of the prophets that we have are true. That's the sixth one. The seventh is, I believe with a perfect faith, that the prophecy of Moses, Allah is was true. And he was a father to the prophets who came before him and after. Obviously it means a father in the archetypal sense. It doesn't mean in the chronological sense because it says here he was a father to those who came before and after. It means he is the, he is the root of the category as it were. Now what's fascinating here is these are 13 fundamentals. They're absolutely essential. Right? These, are, these are the pared down essentials on which Torah rests. Why are there two about prophecy? And furthermore, a very cursory examination of these will show you that the first one certainly includes the second. Again, I believe with a perfect faith, Shekol Divrei Nevi'im Emes. You can't say it more clearly than that. That all the words of the prophets, meaning all the words of all the prophets are true. That certainly includes Moses. I mean, if there's one that it certainly includes, it's Moshe Rabbeinu. Yeah, you mean all the words. And then the seventh one, I believe that the prophecy of Moshe Rabbeinu was true. You just said that the words of all the prophets are true. And then you have to single out as a separate fundamental, completely separate principle, that the prophecy of Moshe is true. And that it's true in the sense that he was a father figure, as it were, to all of, all of prophecy. What does this mean? Why does it need to be... What's not adequate about saying that the words of all the prophets are true, meaning certainly his as well? Why do you need to go further and say, and his words are true? Why is it separate? And to make the question even more difficult, and really extremely difficult is that, you know that the source of these 13 principles, according to the Rambam, is, and, and we've, we've discussed this idea again from another perspective, but just very briefly, what is the source of these 13? You know, one of the mysteries about these is that when you look for a source of 13 principles in Torah, you won't find them. If you look through the text of Chumash, for example, you, will not find thir- you won't find these 13 things listed as principles. And to the, to the, to the uh, cursory glance, you won't find them in the Mishnah either. Now that's very strange. If these are fundamentals, I mean the fundamentals are the most, surely they should be the most, uh, the most visible, the most uh, explicit they should be. When you look for fundamentals in Torah, you won't have much trouble finding ten. Want to find the ten commandments? The explicit. Right? Very, very clearly written, twice in Chumash. But where on earth did the Rambam find these thirteen? Right? This is one of the challenging questions here. Intellectually you want to say there are thirteen of them? Intellectually? Well, it's not so clear. It's not so clear. Intellectual, in these, that means, you see, the, the common notion is that these things are selected because they are, in fact, intellectually the basis. If you don't have one of these, then some part of the building, when you build a building, you have a foundation. You have certain uh, fundamental, elemental, st- structural elements, components. The rest of the building stands on that. If you take away a non-foundation element of the building, the building stands. If you take away a foundation element, any one of them, the building collapses. Therefore, you would think that intellectually there's 13 things that are foundations to the building. No? But it's not so clear. For example, free will doesn't seem to be listed here. Free will is the ultimate fundamental of all Torah. You can find a way to work it in here. But there are many questions if you approach it that way. And in fact, there's, there's very lively argument about this. But what seems to be the case here is that the Rambam found these. In fact, he found them very, very clearly in the Mishnah. The place where the Rambam found these sources, the source for these 13, the Mishnah very, very clearly lists 13 things. But it's the exact opposite of these 13. Exact opposite. There's a place where the Rambam calls from the Mishnah and he summarizes it, he brings it down in his halachic work. I mean, one of the famous questions about this section, of course, is that if these are 13 such fundamentals, why did the Rambam not list them in his halachic work? 
you know, the, the so-called Yad HaChazaka, the Rambam's great halachic compendium, in which he brings down all the laws, all the halachically obligatory aspects of Torah, you won't find these 13 stated like this. Now, if they're fundamental, they certainly, if, if anything should have been included there, these should have been. The Rambam there includes all sorts of things about our knowledge of God, and about, uh, he even has a whole chapter on what's healthy. The Rambam has a whole chapter on how you should eat, and conduct all sorts of physiological functions, in very great detail, because those are halakhically ob- obligatory. He doesn't list these. That's a great mystery. And the answer is, of course, he does list them, and finding his source resolves the issue. The source is that the Rambam lists in his halakhic work there a summary of the 13 things that the Mishnah lists as being those things that if you transgress, you have no share in the world to come. And they happen to be the exact opposites, corollaries of these. Again, the, the Rambam there says like this, do you have a Rambam there? It's not on the show. No? I have a mother. No? Yeah. If you know where it is. If you know. Thanks. Thanks, man. He says this, that there are 13 categories, or there are, there are a number of categories of transgression that deny a person a share in the world to come. Right? That uh, if you break one of these, you have no spiritual life. Other aspects, other things of Torah that are broken are, are disastrous spiritually. But they're not lethal spiritually, if you can make such a distinction. They are the, these things are fundamental in the sense that if you break one of them, you have no connection with the spiritual world. For example, belief in Hashem. The first of these is knowledge of God. I believe with a perfect faith, that the Creator creates and conducts the affairs of all, those, all the created entities, and He, will, who alo- he alone is the one who did, does, and will do all things. Right? Belief in God. Secondly, that he is single. Yachid. Ve'en yechidus kemo. He is single and there's no oneness like his. Right? Thirdly, I believe that he has no body. He's incorporeal, non-physical. Velo yasigu masigaguf. And those of physical aspect like us cannot grasp that his, his, intangible, his incorporeality. And he has no, not only no body, he has no, no image. Not even a, an abstract image. Etc. Fourth, I believe that he's first and last. Fifth, that he's the only one to whom it's fitting to, to serve, let's say, or to pray. No intermediaries, and so forth. The, the, the ones that he lists there are that these same things, if broken, are different than other barriers in the Torah. Am I making myself clear? Of all, No. Of all the transgressions in the Torah, there are two categories. There are the rest, which are bad spiritually if they're broken, and there are these 13, which if they're broken spiritually, have a unique consequence. The consequence is that they deny, they cut off one's connection to the spiritual world. These, as it were, are the vital organs. The others are organs in the body. If they cut, the body's bleeding, but not necessarily dead. These are 13 things that are, so to speak, the vital organs. These are the jugular veins and the coronary arteries and right, the, 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 the aspects of... Um, of the spiritual structure, let's say, that if they're broken, a person's not alive. <coughs> Thank you very much. Thanks, I appreciate it. <coughs> no, I won't take it. Thank you very much. Yeah, no. let, me, let me read you the way he lists it. Thank you. He lists it here, in his, uh, where, where he lists the, um, when he lists the, th- the, the, the transgressions for which a person has no share in the world to come, he says this. These are people who have no share in the world to come. These people are cut off. Judged on the greatness of their transgression. Forever and ever. These are they. Haminim. We'll see soon what that means. You translate that in English as, uh, I don't know, willful deniers or atheists. Apikosin. Also hard to distinguish in English. Kofrim Batera, deniers of Torah. Those who deny the resurrection, etc. He lists the whole process. When he goes into detail, he says this. What? Chamisha nikraim minim. There are five categories that are known as, for want of a better English word, let's call it atheists. First, Somebody who says there's no God and the world has no master. Look at the positive phrasing. I believe with a perfect faith that Hashem creates and conducts. Exactly the same language. I, it, the denier is one who says, the world has no creator and no one who conducts its affairs. Here, I believe with a perfect faith, exact opposite, that there is a creator of the world. Hashem is the creator and Manik Lokola Brim conducts the affairs of the world. Number two, somebody who says that there is a God, 
but they're two or more. Denies the oneness of Hashem, right? He says, God is two or more. Second, I believe with a perfect faith. He's single and there's no oneness like his. Can you see what's happening? Thirdly, he says there is a God and he is one. But he says, but he has a body or an image. Here, thirdly, I believe with a perfect faith that Hashem has no body and and no image. But it couldn't be closer, right? The language, the corollary, what do you call it? The reverse, the obverse here, couldn't be more forth. Fourth. Similarly, somebody who says, He's not first and the first cause. What's the fourth one? I believe with a perfect face, Rishon Ba'achon is first and last. Etc., etc., right? The 13 that are listed here are exactly the converse of the 13 that are listed here. In other words, there are 13 things listed in the Mishnah that are 13 categories of transgression that sever one's connection with the spiritual world entirely. The 13 principles of faith are nothing other than the converse expression of those. After all, if there are 13 things that are so negative spiritually that they cut off one's connection from the spiritual world, the meaning obviously is that you need those to make your connection. You know, the logic of all of them, when you think about it, all of these really are, you may ask the question, why are these 13 singled out so that they destroy you spiritually? The answer is, all of these 13 are your connection to your spirituality. These are your connections to eternity. How do you expect to have a share in that which we call Hashem if you deny His existence? How do you expect to have a share in that which is totally infinite if you believe that it's not infinite? How do you expect, are, are you with me? How do you expect to have a share in that transfinite existence if you believe that it's limited in the finite and has a corporeal element? How do you believe, etc. Et How do you expect to be resurrected yeah, in the resurrection of Tchersa Mesim if you deny its, its reality? All these spiritual elements are your formation of your spiritual world. They are your Neshama's connection. The, our notion of the next world is simply that it's what you yourself build. It's not something you get as a reward. It is what you built. It is your reward because it's what you built. It is what you are. And the, detaching yourself from that, denying those things and breaking those things spiritually, is a famous opinion of the Briskarov, which is a very, very severe opinion. I mean, it's a big argument here between... The Rambam and the Rav is now not the time to go into it. Perhaps we'll have time to go into these 13 in more detail. But there's a very famous opinion of the Briskarov who takes the Rambam's line of thinking and holds that if a person denies these accidentally, he's still not alive spiritually. You know that? Accidentally, a person was brought up not knowing these things. It doesn't make any difference. If you cut your coronary, if you cut your jugular vein accidentally, you're just as dead as if you cut it deliberately. These things are necessary for a spiritual connection. The famous language that he used is an apikaris. Beshoigeg, that means somebody who denies. Beshoigeg, that means. Shogeg means unintentionally, right? Is Nebuch an Apicaris. That means Nebuch, mean, he's to be sympathized with, but he's also. These are necessary spiritually, whether you. Are, are you with me? For, for those who who is terrified, witless at this point, <coughs> there are. There are. There is an opinion. There is an opinion. There is an opinion. That these, that these, if done accidentally or unintentionally, are not lethal only intention. You see, there's a big difference of opinion, opinion whether these things are necessary to attach oneself to, or simply forbidden to detach. Do you understand? That's the subtlety. There's an argument here between the Rishonim, the Rambam, and the Ravid. Are these 13 things that to be spiritually alive you need to attach yourself to? Or is the default position that you are attached, and to die you need to detach yourself from? Are you with me? I suggest you take the more stringent view. Okay? Definitely healthier. Take the more stringent view here, and hold that one needs to strengthen one's attachment here, not simply, not, you know, not fail, not detach oneself. This is a fascinating argument. If there's some other opportunity, perhaps we'll, we'll go into that. But, but all, what we need for now is the notion that these 13 things are the, simply the positive statement of the real source, which is the negative statement. Don't break these things, because if you do, you're not alive spiritually. Okay? So far, so good. Now let's come back to, again, that's a whole subject, a wonderful field in its own right. But let's come back to the application that we need. If we say, I believe with a perfect faith, call divrei neviim emes, that all the words of the prophets are true. Right? Let's translate that into its source. What does that mean? That if you deny this, you're not alive spiritually. Clearly. After all, how do you expect to have a connection to that higher world if you deny that there's a truth? If you deny that what you have of it is false, if you deny that the truth of that connection. The only connection you have to that world is called prophecy. If you deny that channel, how do you expect to be connected? What access do you have? What is your teaching material? Therefore, you need it. Deny it, you have no spiritual life. Seven. 
I believe that the prophecy of Moses, Moshe Rabbeinu's prophecy is true. Meaning, let's translate it into its source. If you say that his prophecy was not true, no spiritual life. Can you hear how extreme that is? Let me, let me say it as bluntly as I can. Imagine an individual who says that all the words of the prophets are true. But Moshe Rabbeinu not. Or rather, all the words of the prophets are true. Including his words. But he wasn't different than the others. I mean, how do you, after all, how do you break the seventh without breaking the sixth? Let's think about it for a moment. How do you break the seventh without breaking the sixth? The sixth says you believe that all the words of all the prophets are true. That certainly includes Moshe, right? So how do you transgress the seventh? You have to say, well, his words are true, but he wasn't in a different category. He wasn't the father of all prophets before and after. What's the consequence of somebody saying that? You're not alive spiritually. Do, 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 do you hear how extreme this is? I see very few encouraging understanding looks. I'm either a very poor teacher or you very slow learners. <laughs> and I have my suspicions about whether... So let me try again. Me, no question. <laughs> let, me, let me try again. If you believe that all the words of the prophets are true, okay, but you don't believe that Moshe Rabbeinu was different, you've cut a fundamental of Torah that threatens your spiritual existence. That's how extreme it is. Why? Why is it that extreme? And the answer is that this is so fundamental to understand. That's why it's, measure, it's, it's worth being put here as a separate fundamental among the 13. Moshe Rabbeinu's prophecy, the prophecy of Moses, is fundamentally, categorically different than all the others. He was in a completely different world. You know, the Ramam himself lists the differences in, 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 um, in recognizable form. He says, for example, there were four categories where Moshe Rabbeinu was completely different. For example, he was... Other prophets, when they received their prophecy, they were in a trance or dream-like state. Moshe Ben was able to stand. Other than prophets, the Rambam himself has a description of prophecy. It's a remarkable... He, he describes what a prophet looks like when he receives his prophecy. He's knocked out of his senses. He's knocked out of all physical capability. He collapses physically. Now, there's no physical ability. The Rambam was able to stand vertical and speak, as it were, face to face with Hashem. Other prophets could only receive prophecy when Hashem gave it to them. Moshe Ben was able to call it into existence at any time. Face to face, mouth to mouth. Now, he goes into the differences here between... Also, it's well known that, unlike all the other prophets, Moshe had to separate from his wife. He had to separate from his wife permanently from a certain stage. His face glowed. The Moshe Chochma goes so far as to explain that he lost his free will. Or to put it more accurately, he entered a category where his free will, this supernal, cosmically great human being, he entered a category where, so to speak, his upper half was part of the higher worlds. And only his lower part, as it were, inhabited our world. The Meshach Chachma explains that he, he lost his free will. He entered a category where his free will became like the free will of an angel. You know, angels have free will too, technically speaking. You know, let's, let's study this for a moment. Human beings have free will, right? The question is, do angels have free will? You know, we know that nothing in the entire universe besides Hashem, so to speak, and us, has free will. Right? No cockroach, no atom, no molecule. There's no point of freedom in the universe except our ability to do what we have to do or refuse to do what we have to do. But the question is, what about angels? Angels are agencies right, that can, technically speaking, angels have free will too. Only, to all intents and purposes, they don't, because they see the consequences so clearly. See, the way to understand this would be, if you stand in front of a blazing inferno, and we say, do you have free will to step into the fire or not? Well, there are two ways to answer that question. Technically, you do have free will. I mean, after all, there's no one stopping you. You could step forward into the fire. But to all intents and purposes, you don't. In other words, when you see the consequence of free will activity very clearly, in effect, it takes away your free will. When you, stop on, when you stand on top of a very tall building and you look over the edge, are you free to jump off or not? I'm talking about somebody who's <coughs> not feeling, you know, a little low that morning. or <laughs> you know, Somebody, under, under normal circumstances, or there aren't too many normal circumstances left anymore, but under what, what would pass for normal circumstances, if you stand there on the edge of the building and you say, are you free to jump off? So technically speaking, you are free. But in, in practical terms, you're not. Because when the consequences of the action are so plain to you, that's some analogy for the free will of angels. 
angels have free will. They can refuse to do the task that they're given. But the, the reason they don't virtually, virtually ever, ever fail is because they, they're exposed to the clarity of the spiritual world. The reason we have free will is because the world is dark to us. We don't see, the reason you hurt someone's feelings, not that any of you present ever would, but, but the reason that people do make mistakes in relationships or elsewhere is because they fool themselves, at least for a moment, that the consequences will not be there. But if you saw the consequences, if you felt the consequences, if you witnessed and experienced the consequences immediately, yes, as you were doing the action, you wouldn't make too many mistakes. It's only because you're blind to the consequences, only because you live in a darkness that you have free will. To that extent, Moshe Rabbeinu lost his free will. He entered a world where he didn't have the kind of free will that human beings have anymore. He became categorically different than any other prophet. Also, his, his prophecy itself, the Nebuah of, yeah, I think we explained once before, not long ago, that the, the hidden depths in Chumash, the hidden depths in Chumash are not hidden the way they are in Nach. If you look in one of the, the prophet's writings, if you look in the writings of the other prophets, you notice that the things that are hidden are hidden in a way where you can't see what they are, but you can see that they're there. That's called Mechuse. Rabbi used to say that's called Mechuse. Mechuse means covered. Covered is not hidden. Covered means you can't see what I have, but you can see that there's something there. Hidden means that you can't see that there's anything there at all. The hidden depths, the Kabbalistically hidden depths in Nach are covered. Very often you see that there's something moving beneath the surface, only you can't see what it is. In Chumash, you can't see anything. You could translate Chumash literally for a six-year-old. A six-year-old can read Chumash from beginning to end and translate every word. Without ever realizing that there's another whole story going on beneath the surface, and another story beneath that, and endless levels, tiers, of layers, of story, of material going on, each one deeper than the one before. And there are many other ways to, to express this, but the, the sum total of them is that Chumash, let, let me suggest just one more, is that the words of all the prophets, each of them has a different style. You know that? The Gemara says that no two prophets speak in the same style. Why? Because each one has a different personality. And each one is refracting. Each one picks up the message and refracts through his own personality. His own... That means he's taking dictation. There's no question about it. He's, he's receiving a message and he's giving over the message as he receives it. But it comes out with a flavor of his personality. That's why no two prophets have the same have the same style. And they're chosen for their own... Ovadja, for example, the prophet, prophet Ovadja, was a Roman convert. And he's the one who prophesies the destruction of Rome. Right? That was his particular... Each prophet had his own particular constellation of characteristics, and that brings... Yeah, his words are, are entirely unrelated to any other prophet. The style that he uses is a function of his own, not his own spiritual nature, let's say. When you read Chumash, it's not like that at all. Chumash is nobody's personality. Moshe Rabbeinu, there's not his personality that transmits story. He is simply the voice that speaks it out. Through his throat, the thing itself is projected. Yeah? It's not that he is... Right? It's not that he is giving it his spin, if you like, or his flavor. It is the words themselves, that's all. Let, let's go back to our question and see if we, can, if we can begin to appreciate the beauty of the answer. Let, let me rephrase the question we began with, and with this, hopefully with this introduction we'll be able to, to understand the the depth of the answer. He says this. Let me, let me succinctly state the question again. What's the conversation? The conversation is, Hashem says, Moshe, go down to Egypt, say your message. Moshe turns back and says, Hashem, I cannot speak clearly. Hashem argues with him, tries to convince him, and finally, in so seeming, so to speak, exasperation, says, Aaron, your brother, will speak for you. Moshe turns back and says, I cannot speak. And Hashem says, Aaron, your brother, will be your prophet. The meaning is this. When Hashem said to Moshe, Moshe, you must speak your prophecy, he turned back to Hashem and said, look, I cannot say that message because I have a problem with, with speech. So Hashem says to him, Aaron will speak for you. Your brother will speak for you. And here's a problem. And the problem is that the, the, in the laws of prophecy, it's brought down, the Ramam himself deals with this, it's brought down that the obligation of a prophet is to say his own prophecy. He may not say it to somebody else who then speaks it out. Okay, do you know that in the laws of prophecy there is a two-pronged, there is a law that is two, a two-sided blade, yes, which is that a prophet is required to say his own prophecy, he must say his own nevoah, on pain of death, which means he may not s- subdue his prophecy, it's called kovesh is nevoah, so he may not subdue his prophecy and refuse to say it, and on the other hand he must say it himself, he can't say it to somebody else. How do we know that a prophet may not conquer or subdue his prophecy? Who do we learn that from? From Jonah, right? From Jonah, who tried to 
escape his, he tried to leave Israel. You know, one of the, one of the axioms of prophecy is that it manifests only in Israel. Generally speaking, only in Israel. In certain, certain conditions. He tried to leave Israel so he wouldn't hear the prophetic message anymore. Right? He tried not to deliver. There's a whole reason why he did not want to deliver his message. The prophet's not free to do that. When he's chosen and he has to say his message, he may not subdue his prophet, he has to say it over. And furthermore, he must say it himself. You know, in certain Kabbalistic sources, it's written that when a prophet receives a prophecy, all other prophets alive at the same time receive the same message at the same time. They're all tuned to the wavelength of prophecy. They all pick up the message, but they all pick it up with his name or her name. And they all know that they may not say it, but that that person has to. In fact, there's even a notion that if testimony ever has to be brought against a prophet, if it would ever, if you could think of a circumstance where it would be necessary, that a prophet was given, a novi was given a nevu and never said it, who would be able to testify? All other prophets alive in his generation who had picked up the same message with his name, knew that they were forbidden to say it and knew that he was obliged, and they could testify to that, to that fact. Okay? So again, in summary, what's the law? When a Novi, when a prophet receives prophecy, he must say it, and he may say it over to no one else. He was chosen, he must say his message, on pain of death. Do you see the problem? So Moshe says to Hashem, Hashem says, God says, Moshe, go and say your prophecy. And Moshe says, Hashem, I cannot speak. And Hashem says to him, don't worry, Aaron, your brother, will speak for you. So he turns back to Hashem and he says, but Hashem, I cannot speak. What will it help? What are you helping by telling me that Aaron will speak for me? I'm forbidden. You know that. You wrote the laws. You made the laws. How, if I will stand there in, Pharaoh, in Pharaoh's court, and I will get my message from you, and I will hand it over to my brother, and he will be the spokesman, I'm breaking the law of a prophet saying his own prophecy. Nevoah comes out of the mouth. You have to stand that when the prophet speaks, it's not words coming out of his mouth. The Rambam makes it plain that when you hear a Nabi speaking, you don't hear a man saying words. You, you, you experience the message. This is not a person telling you what will be in the future. You, you reverberate yourself. You resonate yourself with the man. To understand that prophecy is not somebody who sort of looks in a, a, a beautific sort of trance-like state and then words issue from his mouth and you take it or leave it. That's not the way prophecy was. Nebuah was an experience where the listeners were electrified. You yourself experience the message. Not to say you reach the level of prophecy, but you experience the electricity of the message. Right? So he had to do that experience. He couldn't say it to somebody else. So do you understand what his problem was? Go and say your message. I cannot speak. Don't worry, you'll say it over to Aaron. He'll speak for you. But Hashem, you yourself outlaw that. And then Hashem comes to him with the explanation. Hashem says, you are making a great error. If you think that what I want is that you should go and be the prophet and say over your message and Aaron, your brother, will be your spokesman, you're making a big mistake. You're making a big mistake. You will not be the prophet. You will be the prophecy. And he'll be the prophet. Send this. Aaron Achicha, Aaron your brother, ye nevi'echa. The words mean are, are meant literally. When Hashem said to him, Aaron your brother will be your prophet, he did not mean in a metaphorical sense your spokesman. He will be the Navi. And he will, you will not be the, 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 the medium, you'll be the message. See, Moshe Rabbeinu thought that he would be a prophet, and he would say over his prophecy, and his brother would say the words. That's forbidden. Hashem said, I have not forgotten the rules. I do not intend you to be a prophet. I intend you to be categorically different. You will be the message itself. And he will receive you as his prophecy. And he will be the prophet speaking out in the perfect normal sense. He will speak out prophecy. See that Moshe Rabbeinu here, this ties together everything we've been saying this evening. Moshe Rabbeinu was not on the level of a prophet who said a message. He was elevated to the level of the message itself. There was no distinction between him as a channel and the material that he speaks. He speaks over, he becomes the message itself. He is absorbed into that world. Anybody listening to him, as it were, becomes on a prophetic level himself. And therefore, and therefore, that's the, that's the resolution. That's, the, that's how the conversation flows. Moshe, go down and say your message to Paroi, to the Jewish people, but Hashem, I cannot speak. Aaron will be your spokesman. He doesn't pick up here what Hashem means. But he turns back and says, Hashem, how will that help? Hashem says, no. You will be the message itself. You will be an Elohim Leparoi. I meant those words. You will be the emanation of myself, the divine name itself. Va'aron achicha, and Aaron your brother, Aaron your brother, Aaron Rafi'iyyeh He will be your prophet. He'll pick up you, as it were. And he'll speak out his own Nebu, which is you. It's a remarkably beautiful explanation of the, the sequence of the conversation. But the importance of it for us is not only, of course, it's, it's beauty. The importance of it for us is the understanding that as now we move into the book of Shmois, Book of, uh, what's it called, Exodus? 
Is that right? The book that begins the discussion of the Jewish people moving into, into nationhood as opposed to the, to the generation of the fathers, forefathers, mothers, is now that central figure becomes and will remain that to the, to the end of time. The Rambam says clearly that the, the Mashiach himself will not be greater. The Messiah, the Mashiach himself will be less in prophecy than Moshe He will be wiser than Shlomo, somewhat wiser than King Solomon, and less in prophecy than Moshe. There will never be anybody on that level. Even the Mashiach. Even though it's true that when you put the name Moshe together with David, Moshe and David together, the numerical equivalent is Mashiach. Right? With the koila, that means you have to make a summary. You, you, it comes to one less than the word Mashiach. Yes, the word Mashiach, you, you put together the one more, put together the one, meaning what we call the koila, which puts them together. Those two add up, Moshe and David, which means the same... The same um, it means Moshe together with his final as it were, representation or manifestation in the world, which is the messianic persona, the two of them. But Moshe Rabbeinu is that point, he is that, he is that level of prophecy, which means that for us, as we move into this book, we start, we start reading it now and learning it, what we have to really feel here is that unlike other aspects of Tanakh, when you read the words of a prophet, you're hearing a message transmitted through the personality of a prophet. Here, you are hearing, as it were, Hashem himself, you're not hearing anything transmitted or refracted or reflected through the lens of the personality of a prophet, no matter how great. Here you are, are elevated virtually yeah, to the status yourself of being able to receive that message. That's its importance. And therefore, and therefore, hopefully what we shared this evening is the beginning of an insight into the immediacy of our contact with, with Chumash. Obviously, all of Torah is Torah. All of it comes from the same source. There's no question about that. But what has to be appreciated in learning Chumash is that we are, we are Talmidim, Moshe Rabbeinu, we are Talmidim of that great Rebbe who was more than a prophet, fundamentally more than a prophet, not just another prophet, but categorically different. He was the father of those who came before and those who came after, and therefore the nature of his message is entirely different.